Get a Book. Today presents Strike Battleship Engineers, Book Two in the Starships at War series by Shane Lachlan Black. Copyright 2017. Stand by for a priority message from Skywatch Command. The Starships universe kicks off with Starships at War, my five novel series featuring the adventures of Captain Jason Hunter and the Bandit Jacks. Starship Expeditionary Fleet is the seven novella sequel story of the Battleship Argent and the build-up to the Second Praetorian Interstellar War. Destroy All Starships is series number three, when the Human Core Alliance of Worlds and the Dragons of the Starn Star Empire launch thousands of warships into a devastating conflict that will decide the future of the galaxy. Sixteen titles and more on the way. We're making it all available in ebooks, print books, and our all new audiobooks. No DRM, no apps, no compatibility issues, instant delivery, hours and hours of entertainment, car, home, gym, at the beach, anywhere, anytime, any device that can play audio can play my audiobooks and nobody can beat my prices. All you have to do is remember one web address, shane.lachlan.black. That will take you to the Get a Book title of the day, where all our best deals can be found. It's continuously updated, so bookmark and visit often. All ahead, battle speed. Chapter 19 She's out here somewhere, Lieutenant. Nightwing 6 silently crept through space. The Skywatch Search and Rescue, SR Corvette, was outfitted with the latest counter-track and counter-detection systems. She was essentially an electronic warfare vessel built around a highly advanced surgical trauma unit. She was under the command of Argent Executive Officer Commander Anora Doverly and six highly trained members of her search and rescue team. Sixteen beam sweeps, ma'am. Negative contact on the specified transponder, Lieutenant Anders replied from the sensor station. Very well. Advance the point and put us in the next survey pattern, Joss. Aye, ma'am. Shifting all control patterns to point control delta. New parabolic course 17 degrees and orbiting. Tactical, report all contacts. Negative contacts, ma'am, Anders replied, wondering why the XO would ask to report all contacts moments after a negative transponder report. What is our distance to the frontier, Joss? By standard reckoning, the closest point inside the Sarn frontier is 1.12 million miles bearing 040. Lieutenant, your equipment isn't tuned correctly. There is a contact on the board that you're missing. Run a harmonics reflection test on all channels and do it quickly, please. Aye, ma'am, Anders replied. How does she know all that? The junior lieutenant got to work running tests on all of his system's equipment. Okay, Joss. Argent Skywatch picked up a disaster buoy two weeks ago with the Saratoga's transponder code. Let's get the scanners tuned correctly. She's a Kovacs-class cruiser with missile racks in place of the Blaine-class particle beam batteries. Crew of 211. If she's out here, she must have run into an over-the-line patrol of some kind, which means we need to stay dark and quiet. No abrupt maneuvers, understand? Hi, ma'am. Slow and steady. No active signals, Lieutenant. Understand? Yes, ma'am. Test cycle will complete in 40 seconds. Doverly got up and walked across the relatively spacious Corvette's bridge to the forward view screen. Nightwing command decks were reminiscent of those built into 21st century wet Navy attack submarines. Joss, put the sector up on the screen and give me a centered view on the closest point inside Sarn space. The reactive crystal display switched to a top-down view of the Nightwing's patrol area. Not far from the edge of the frontier, there was a cluster of asteroids off by itself. Sarn space was bordered at the edge of the Gelfos star system, so any experienced tactical officer would expect to find a certain amount of debris at system's edge. There was also the little matter of the Raleo and Bayon systems, which each posed unique problems of their own. But for Anora, there was something about that particular cluster of rocks in space. All stop, all quiet. Aye, ma'am, Joss replied. The Nightwing slowed and then stopped in space before all but her emergency life support systems powered down to minimal station-keeping levels. Lieutenant, tell me a happy story about those sensors, Doverly said quietly. 
The red glow from the alert lights illuminated her face from below, making her expression appear rather ominous. Navicomp is recommending we retune the bass harmonics by 0.071, ma'am. Very good. When you do, you're going to catch a picket formation in that asteroid cluster at 043. Don't panic and don't go active. Turn your auto-targeting systems off and stand by. Doverly took her seat in the center chair and quietly lashed up her shock harness. Anders completed his retune of the system and almost immediately it lit up with new contacts. A quiet, jangly little alarm went off. He silenced it and spoke with as much self-control as he could muster. It didn't stop his voice from trembling just a little, however. New contacts bearing 046. Battle computer reports a Sarn battlecruiser and two escort destroyers, stopped in space and maintaining station six miles inside the frontier. Joss, take us to general quarters, quiet alarm. Disengage all engines and cut power to maneuvering thrusters. We'll drift, ma'am. Affirmative. We don't want to take any chances of an energy emission signal. Anders, set your RF ambient to plus or minus 0.5. Half a watt of power. Set your passive motion sensors to watch that asteroid cluster. Turn everything else off. Aye, ma'am, Anders replied. He struggled to follow the commander's orders. It was a lot easier to say all those things than it was to do them in the proper order without making a mistake. Range to hostile contacts, Doverly said. Point nine megaclicks, Joss replied. I have the Saratoga, ma'am, off our starboard quarter bearing 171 Mark 40. Range two megaclicks. She stopped in space and appears to be drifting. She's off her axis as well. No active emissions or signals. Reactor signature is a match with 4-9's confidence, Anders reported. Are we active, Lieutenant? Negative, ma'am. Very well. We're going to need to maneuver, Joss. We've got to recover the Saratoga, whatever the risk. Quietly re-engage our thrusters and prepare a phantom probe. Match the Lieutenant's RF signature and stand by to launch. Plot an intercept course to the Saratoga and stand by to come about. Doverly keyed her intraship comlink. Sickbay Bridge. Tyron here. Ensign, we may have wounded. Stand by for emergency triage operations. Report readiness in two minutes. Bridge out. Maneuvering thrusters engaged, Commander. Stand in. Belay that order, Doverly snapped. All quiet. Nightwing 1's main screen told the story. The passive signatures of another battlecruiser were registering now. She was moving on an oblique course relative to Doverly's ship and for that she was more than thankful. It appeared the SAR Corvette had detected the EM signatures and drive fields first, then had used the SRS systems to confirm. The contact icon blinked, faded, and reappeared as the navigational and battle computers struggled to keep up with the sudden barrage of new information. Commander Doverly returned to the center chair. Her crew just stared at the ferocious silhouette of death moving through space. This doesn't look like an exercise to me, Joss exhaled. Agreed. Two ships of the line moving at once only means one thing. All right, we'll come at it from the other direction. Plot a parabolic course to the Saratoga. Don't let us get closer than a mega click to either formation. Maneuvering, all ahead slow. Joss carefully nudged Nightwing 1 into motion. The sleek black ship silently banked away from the oncoming vessels and faded into the starry darkness. Chapter 20 to a casual observer, the stunning young woman sitting at a dingy table deep into the crowd at the Sinusish Tap House would have looked roughly as appropriate as a princess of the realm shoveling hog slop into wooden buckets. She was almost ethereal in her bearing. She wore a glowing miner's stone around her neck on an impeccably filigreed triluminum chain. The wheezy, rat like man sitting on the opposite side of the flimsy pot metal table, on the other hand, would more likely have been paid rather handsomely to go away. He was dressed in what for all of known space looked like an emergency weather tarp secured by coarse brown twine. He was literally covered in tattoos, the most prominent of which made the skin appear to be missing on one side of his face. At frequent intervals he shoved more and more money of varying origins and denominations across the table while the angelic girl ignored both it and his leering words. I will soon be coming into a small fortune, my dear. Best for a future noble to seize opportunity while it is available. He unrolled a map, which only made the girl shift her weight to try and get further away from him. She exerted considerable effort to look the opposite direction. These are my claims. The largest belong to my late partner. Even the frontier patrols have conceded my paperwork is all in. Without warning, an enormous hand reached over the rat man's shoulder, grabbed him by his grubby garment, and yanked him into the air. 
His feet banged into the table. The young woman rescued her drink as money clattered all over the room. In seconds, it was pounced upon and vacuumed up by the crowd. Lucas Moody dropped the scrambling little man on the floor, lifted him back up by the nape of his neck and shoved him through the bar. Ratman turned and weakly attempted to kick the imposing Marine officer, only to be roughly pushed backwards. He stumbled and fell. Moody picked him up by his hair again and continued shoving him forward. The mismatched fight continued until the severely dressed officer reached a slightly more inviting booth where Captain Jason Hunter was seated. Moo slammed the cowering little man down on the seat, then folded his enormous arms. Top of the morning to you, Mumph, Hunter said without looking up. On the table was the captain's blaster, a whiskey on the rocks and a reading pad. The alternately terrified and angry little wretch drew a small gun. Moo reacted with lightning speed, nearly broke Ratman's wrist disarming him, and then whacked him across the mouth with the blaster's grip. Moo holstered the weapon in his belt and remained standing, looming over the table. Mumph, are you angry with me? The Ratman wiped the blood from the corner of his mouth, then spat his reply. If I seen with Skywatch, I die. That would be a shame, Hunter replied after calmly taking a sip from his drink and turning the page. Problem is, you were seen with another Skywatch officer less than a year ago. Somehow all that information showed up in an Inspector General's report, but they didn't bother to explain what brought you two together. So I thought I'd follow up. I'm going to make you my game show host. Ratty looked up at the Marine officer with his upper lip twitching. Moo glared. He means you're the man with the answers. Mumph lunged across the table. Moo yanked him up by the hair and slammed him back in his seat. Ratty gasped for air. The Marine officer calmly folded his arms again. See, here's the thing, Jason said, taking a moment to replace the napkin under his glass. The last time we saw Colonel Atwell, he was telling stories about evil aliens coming to eat us all. Thing is, we ain't seen many aliens yet. What I do have is a dead admiral, nine destroyed starships, and a lot of missing men and women. Those are the big questions, Mumph, and I expect to walk out of here with my prizes. Mumph drew a knife. The resulting struggle ended with the varlet's upper body being rammed into the table at least twice. The pieces of the broken knife clattered on the floor before Moo grabbed Mumph by the face and shoved him back into the booth. You're free to speak up any time you like, my friend, Jason said. Otherwise, my wingman here will be more than happy to hammer this table into a set of flatware using your teeth for tools. The look on Jason Hunter's face was much darker than Mumph remembered ever seeing it. He wasn't quite sure if the captain was serious or not. I never met with Atwell, Mumph wheezed through a golf ball-sized contusion. Jason's eyebrow rose. That answer implied a mysterious someone had met with the renegade ground forces officer, not to mention the fact Mumph identified the colonel by name. Instead of inviting a stonewall, Hunter approached the subject from a non-threatening angle. Whatever was discussed required a huge amount of coordination, my friend. The bomb he dropped into Argent's lift shaft was built at the opposite end of this street. How can you possibly know that? Ratty spat. Let's just say I have some friends in the engineering field. The device was part of a set of four identical handheld explosive devices made by one of those bug-faced mercenaries. Unfortunately for your friend, they were sabotaged before delivery. That gave my friends a chance to inspect them. Surely you've heard the story by now. The builder was offed by a bounty hunter because you tipped off his rivals. There's a couple of his friends on their way here right now and they're looking for you. Your whole operation is blown. How many more days you walk on this rock depend on how much truth you tell me in the next 60 seconds. The instructions were transmitted anonymously, Mumph sneered. My client only told Skywatch what they wanted to hear. I provide hardware. Hunter squinted. The next question didn't even need to be asked. Ratty looked up at Moo. He knew he had already said too much and he also knew there was nowhere to run. The clock was ticking. If what Hunter said was true, just sitting at the table made him a convenient target. If he ran, he would have two rather dangerous Skywatch officers after him as well. I want a deal. Mumph, I make one call and I'll have the best-dressed pirates north of Skatoon waiting in your hideout before you get out the door. There's nothing they love more than the smell of nuceline and pressurized carbunk except maybe the smell of money. And there's big money in making things go boom. But then, I suppose you already know that since you've been supplying Gitarn Triluminum smugglers with munitions for years, that means there's even bigger money in making you go boom. Are you with me? 
The more Hunter talked, the more exaggerated the look of horror became on Mump's bruised and bleeding face. Last chance, Moo growled. Exile. Let me go into exile in Sarn territory. I'll stay out of core space for good. Hunter's expression looked like a man with a handful of good cards and a hell of a lot of checks stacked nearby. I'll give you a two-day head start. But understand this, my friend. You hoo me, and I don't care how far into enemy territory you run. I'll muster a pursuit fleet you'll feel before you see. Clear? The light caught Hunter's gleaming eagle insignia as if to emphasize to the angry smuggler his counterparty was anything but a no-rank wannabe. Mump swallowed hard, then nodded. What is going on between you and Atwell? Chapter 21 Sneaking through an abandoned ship of the line was something Lieutenant Islington never thought she would experience. She had taken a moment to note there were corridor junctions aboard Argent with more square footage than her own bridge, but some things were to be expected when a ship had to support a crew of more than 800 people divided between operations, pilots, marines, deck crews, engineering and scientific specialists. And even though the enemy boarding party on the flight deck had been neutralized, there was the ever-present possibility of other Sarn hostels aboard Argent. In fact, Islington mused, they could be around the next corner, and there were a lot of corners between Deck 29 and the bridge. Islington and her tactical officer ducked into the botany lab and quietly activated the manual door lock. Minimal lighting came to life as the deck systems registered movement in the formerly abandoned facility. The captain keyed her comlink. Islington to engineering. Engineering, Brogan. Where are we, chief? Everything is where it's supposed to be, ma'am. There wasn't any kind of a fight down here that I can see. Wherever the crew went, they just left. They weren't attacked. How does that help me get main power online? Well, there's good news and bad news. You know the drill. Islington cracked the door and peered down the corridor. The bad news is if anything down here is even jostled a little, you're down across the board and there is absolutely no hope of even attempting damage control. It would take an hour just to do the running back and forth between stations. I can't kick in auxiliary power either because that would require me to dampen reactions in all eight of the mains at once and that's an all-day job for one person. Acknowledged. I can live with that if I get navigation. The captain and Grant slipped out of the lab and moved towards Argent Center Deck 29 facility. The good news is nothing's damaged down here. We can power up by the checklist. If you and the ensign can man the pilot and tactical stations on the bridge, we can fly this beast and maybe even turn it a little. But that's all. We're going to need every single person aboard just to do that much. Islington and Grant arrived at the Center Deck lift. If we can make the Sarn think twice, that's all we'll need, engineer. There is another factor, Captain, Brogan said. Whatever we do, we're going to need to perform a rather pointed maneuver to get her out of orbit. If we get caught in Bayonne 3's gravity well, we may not have the coordination to stay out of the atmosphere. If this thing catches even the edge of the thermosphere, we're going down in a fireball that will be visible from the next star system. Islington hesitated. Up to now, she had never commanded or flown a ship with more than four engines. Getting Minstrel out of an atmosphere was a feat she could likely accomplish alone in her sleep. Argent had eight engines, each many times the size of her entire ship. There would be no navigational shielding, no SRS shielding, no navigational computer, no navigator and no emergency systems to fall back on if their attempt to pull the ship into space failed. It was very much like trying to compete in the Baja 1000 with one person using their hands to operate the gas pedal, another person using their feet to turn the steering wheel, and a third person holding an umbrella out the window to slow the car down if necessary. Fun and potentially entertaining on the ground. Not so much fun if you're going Mach 27 190 miles in the air in a 200-000-ton battleship full of fusion reactors and explosives. Then there was the time factor. At best, she and Cal were going to have minutes to get acclimated before they were going up against a coordinated task force of three warships. We'll just have to improvise then, Chief. Islington out. The captain entered the key sequence to request bridge access and sighed with relief when Argent recognized her and granted authorization. One of the four lift cars started its descent from more than 30 stories above the two minstrel officers. What I really need is command computer access, and I don't think I'm going to get it, the captain muttered. Why not? Grant asked. You're a ship's captain. Why wouldn't Argent acknowledge you? 
Because technically under regulations I'm not a command officer, Ensign, Islington replied. Even though I've been posted to a CO's billet, I don't have the technical authority to assume command of another officer's ship. And the lowest command rank is lieutenant commander, Grant said. Perfect. Exactly. Not enough brass on this officer's shoulder to make a key big enough for that lock, as my old academy instructor would say. But he was also fond of saying, Captains always find a way, so that's exactly what I'm going to do. What do you mean? Cal asked, looking up as the lift car approached. I'm assuming command of this ship in ten minutes. But you just said you can't do that. Everyone will know it's not true. The Sarn won't. Chapter 22 no, no. One of the things that had distinguished the Bandit Jacks from many other fighter squadrons was their total disregard for danger. The young Lieutenant Commander Hunter was like an unconventional quarterback in his propensity for the unexpected. If you tried to defend against the pass, he would run. If you blitzed, he would shovel past the ball right through your rush. If you started to think he was settling into some kind of a pattern, the next thing you knew he would have his fullback throwing the ball and himself running a crossing route to catch it for a game-winning touchdown. Once he was teamed up with enough talent, the battle tactics he employed were almost magical. Had there been a way to do it, Skywatch would have made a fortune selling tickets to engagements between Hunter's five-strong fighter wing and their many opponents. It would have been the spaceflight equivalent of Friday Night Wrestling. All that would be needed would be a cash bar and an attractive girl to hold up the round numbers. What some understood but most didn't was that Hunter inspired his pilots to do the very same things he did. Confidence radiated from his words and even from his very presence like comfort from a Christmas fireplace. If Hunter was on the mission, the outcome was never in doubt. The only uncertainty was what crazy, improbable, disaster-defying thing he would do to win. His first crew chief coined his nickname El Bandito because it seemed less that Hunter won victories and more that he stole them right off the table with everyone watching and then dared the rest of the dinner guests to try and take them back. At this particular moment, one of the pilots he had a considerable transforming effect on was in a low-vector attack approach to three ships, any one of which could vaporize her fighter with one shot. Under normal circumstances, no jack driver would ever consider going head-to-head -head against a task force consisting of 340 ton Sarn destroyers. But this was no ordinary pilot. This was Jack-3 starboard wing of the original masked raider known more by reputation and call sign than by name. Like her flight leader, Zoni Tixia had so many nicknames by this point one could almost tell what region of space they were in by how they referred to her. Diamond Jack, Trip Wing, The Hook and Three Ball were among the more common, but Crimson J, Rabbit with a Gun, The Red Duchesses and Radio Girl had also been used occasionally. The last on that list was of particular significance at this moment, because this Yellow Jacket pilot also happened to be a decorated Signals Corps officer who was just now putting the finishing touches on an electronic riposte so daring it just might earn her another nickname and some hardware to go with it. The Jackrabbit anti-missile configuration her captain had authorized weeks before was working perfectly, but having the additional targeting circuitry wasn't what made the component dangerous. It was the fact it gave Zoni the capacity to perform high-powered electromagnetic improvisation literally on the fly. It was essentially the potential for mayhem if a legendary rock guitarist were given the ability to fight attacking spaceships with power cords, hairstyles, and string-bending solos. One thing was clear. If the Jackrabbit-enhanced fighter could coordinate a multi-vessel defensive envelope on its own, it could certainly double as a formidable electronic countermeasures ECM system. Putting Zoni Tixia in control of such a system was like letting King David pick a fight in a rock quarry. Buck four to Argent. Argent, Islington. I'm 20 seconds out. I'm going to guess I'm on my own when I engage Kilowatt Alpha 1. My engineering chief tells me we can maneuver, but we're going to have to climb out of orbit first. Whatever we do, it isn't going to be coordinated, Lieutenant. You and Minstrel are going to need to run interference for us until we get the boilers lit. Can you access tactical from your location? My TAC officer and I are on the bridge. What did you have in mind? Tell your officer to go active with your short-range targeting systems. They are independently powered for emergencies. Configure maximum amplitude narrow frequency beam right at their hard points. Light up the lead unit. I'm going to pretend to be a squadron and see if I can break them up. Stand by. On the bridge of Argent, Calvin Grant was already seated at the tactical station. 
Some of the controls looked familiar to him, but he wasn't well acquainted with the idea of a ship with eight separate tactical arrays. After a few moments of high-pressure stress, he finally found the starboard control systems and set the SRS detection bank to local emergency power. Lieutenant Islington was seated at the con, gradually becoming aware of just how big a strike battleship was. Now, Ensign, deflection antennas on Argent's starboard main and flight hulls filled the EM spectrum with pointed waveform transmissions. From the Sarn perspective, it was like watching a lit match turn into a 10,000-acre inferno-consumed forest. Just as their own targeting systems were starting to push back against the unbelievable power Argent was channeling, the alien blood in the lead destroyer's weapons officer ran cold. On his scope, a wedge of 22 torpedo-armed yellowjacket fighters exploded out of the interference and powered into attack vectors. The lead jack piggybacked a targeting beacon and acquired a heavy lock on the lead destroyer, which set off panic alarms all over its bridge. Alpha-1 and Alpha-2 swerved in opposite directions, trying to avoid the oncoming swarm of angry little phantoms. Kilowatt Alpha-2 drew the short straw by virtue of its delayed arrival at zero point. Alpha-1 opened fire on the fighter contacts with its lateral batteries, only to watch helplessly as none of the onrushing yellow jackets were hit. One of the attackers, however, rolled out of the formation and unexpectedly raced for the second ship's starboard quarter. Zoni pushed her tough little fighter to its maximum tolerances, pouring everything she had into the desperate attempt to get a torpedo lock on Alpha-2's engines. A barrage of point defense missiles leaped into space from Alpha-2's starboard launchers and tore after Buccaneer 4, ramping their sprint engines to try and out-angle the Jackrabbit pilot to the optimum firing position just off Alpha-2's trailing edge. Zoni's eyes widened as her elaborate anti-missile technology lit up like a combination Christmas tree and pinball machine. Buck 4 pivoted in space and came up on the leading edge of the missile wing. Flying backwards at hundreds of miles a second, the fighter's targeting systems engaged their multi-mode heuristic tracking all at once, and suddenly one weapons bank was prepping millisecond fire bursts against more than 18 inbounds. Oh glory, Zoni whispered as she watched her signature electronics achievement preparing to do things a full squadron of fighters would have required a week of practice to even attempt. Buck-4 suddenly powered down its forward vectoring, pivoted 70 degrees, and went into an engine's neutral counter-thrusting skid. Zoni held on to the controls, hoping she was interpreting her ship's actions properly. Sure enough, the lead missile broke range exactly as predicted, and Badu's fighter went to work. The first shot was a 1.8% power burst from the forward cannons that neatly chopped the aft section off the lead missile, causing it to tumble past at a breakaway speed of nearly 1,000 miles a second. It detonated at a range of 6 miles. From the time Missile 1 was hit, it took Buccaneer 4 2.7 seconds to pivot another 242 degrees true and shred the rest of the missile wing with both forward and aft weapons fire. The engines kicked back to battle speed, and Zoni's fighter rocketed out of a thicket of explosions directly into the trailing wake of target Kilowatt Alpha 2. The phrase, pirouette of fire, wouldn't have done the maneuver justice, mainly because such a feat by a single fighter had never been done before. Point defense slashed and tore at the space around her, itself desperate to get ahead of a legendary pilot's silky smooth evasive skills, but it was too late. For whatever reason, Alpha-2 itself made no attempt to defend its most vulnerable section, apparently confident its powerful anti-fighter weaponry would be enough. Zoni surmised the Sarn captain was just now realizing his battle tactics, while exactly right for the theoretical battle space, were totally wrong for this opponent. The destroyer's last maneuver was to try and accelerate to a position above and behind the formation's lead vessel, apparently to try and enlist the lead ship's defensive firepower. Buccaneer 4's sophisticated targeting systems all lined up at once. The jangling lock indicator sounded in Zoni's helmet for a few seconds, then settled into an ominous tone as the visual indicators swapped colors. The Yellow Jacket's weapon lock lit up the much larger destroyer's aft hull as it ran for its life. Buck 4 has wave and tone. The howling waveform match sounded across the entire communications net while the flashing targeting lattice reflected from Zoni's expressionless helmet blast shield. Diamond Jack rocketed directly into the warship's engine wake at an attack velocity of more than 700 miles per second. Fox 3. Zoni pulled her weapon release handle and banked away. The Hemlock-class torpedo separated from the fighter and activated its own sprint burners. 
Buccaneer 4 was already 3,000 miles away and performing a wide return arc in preparation for another run when the antimatter warhead plunged more than 170 feet into the Sarn hull and detonated. The explosion shattered reality for 10 miles in every direction. Alpha-1 was thrown clear as the aft hull of Alpha-2 ruptured into a hellish plasma fire that drew a yellow-white spiraling trail across space. Splash-1. Confirm impact with high-power warhead. Buck-4 now engaging hostile contact kilowatt Alpha-1. 60 seconds. Alpha-2 had already broken up. A trail of atmosphere and debris soared across the port edge of Alpha-1's course. Rebecca Islington just stared at Argent's main view screen. She had heard stories, but watching a single-seat fighter kill a destroyer was beyond her wildest imaginings. Chapter 23 Senior Crew Chief Sean Brogan stood resolute before the floor-to-ceiling coolant transfer control bank at the base of Argent Fusion Reactor 4. His feet were shoulder-width. He was closing and opening his fingers, preparing himself for what was about to happen on Argent's engineering deck. The last time he had worked with a von Mansfried fusion plant was when he was obtaining his ratings for operating multi-reactor warships. Prior to being assigned to Islington's command, he was one of the fleet's preeminent fission specialists. It wouldn't have taken him long to get up to speed on the newest in starship power systems, but he was in such high demand elsewhere in the fleet, he didn't have as much time as he would have liked. He rubbed his bald head with freshly limbered up fingers and took a deep breath. The equivalent power plant aboard Minstrel was roughly the size of a small delivery van. This beast was nearly ten stories tall and had seven backups just like it. All right, Corporal. Watch the screen next to your controls and make sure it is set to mnemonics display mode before we start the clock. Do you have that set up? There will be a circle with four dots inside it at the base of the display. Corporal Nathan Dempsey was not far away, stationed at the multi-axis reaction mass control bank. The display has a circle with four dots. I think it's set up correctly, sir. Don't call me, sir. I'm a crew chief. I drive starships. Aye, chief. All right, we've got a clean chamber. Now we're going to do this by the numbers. Because if we hork the procedure, we'll have to manually scram the reactor and start over. But we won't get a chance to start over because we'll burn up. You tracking me, corporal? Aye, chief. By the numbers. Laser capacitance chamber set to standard timing. Rate 0009 or 2. Mark. Okay, I've got colors, shapes, and a bunch of text on the screen. Just read me everything in yellow and follow the mnemonics as they appear on the screen. They will show you what controls to operate. The green text is your instructions. I. Chamber temperature 81 degrees and rising with intolerance envelope. Stand by. 21 seconds, Corporal Dempsey shouted. There was no going back. Cold starting Argent's number four fusion reactor had to be done on a precisely timed clock, with the last 10 to 15 steps performed to within computer controlled tolerances of fractions of a millisecond. There was little room for error, as the initial reactions took place with the union of deuterium isotopes, a precisely controlled magnetic field, and a high powered mode locked laser firing from hundreds of thousands of disparate axes. If they were successful and the timing was right, Reactor 4 would initiate its first controlled fusion reaction, programmed to last for just over 30 seconds and generating more than 60 megawatts of electrical power. The first run, as it was called, was just enough to establish a containment field so they could increase reaction mass to 1% power. Chief Brogan used both hands to close the enormous junctions for the metallic liquid sodium coolant reservoir. One of the key tasks to be completed in time for the first power transfer from the reactor would be to pour a fantastic amount of heat into the coolant sink, then throw power to the conductive electromagnetic pressure energy transfer system so heat could be bled out of the reaction matrix at a rapidly increasing rate. As more fuel was introduced into the chamber, the amount of excess heat that would have to be carried away would begin to climb. Since Argent sodium coolant was electrically conductive, its reactor heat transfer systems were based on the same scientific principles as her Havoc batteries and fighter launch tunnels. They were essentially continuously powered railgun-like pipes that moved the coolant along by manipulating electromagnetic energy. At just over 12% power, coolant would be pressurized into a uniform balanced mass and moved through the pipelines at supersonic speeds, a process called superstreaming. The computer-controlled near-zero turbulence of the sodium coolant inside the conduits was what made the von Mansfried reactor design a reality. 
It increased electrical energy yields more than 40% above the next best competing design without increasing size or exceeding equivalent fuel consumption. The result was a cooling system that could compete respectably with the Grand Coulee Dam in terms of how much mass it could move from one place to the next in a given interval. Tertiary Phase Energy Transfer Panels at Base Capacitance Affirmative. Secondary Phase Energy Transfer Panels at plus 1 volt per 20 mL square. Confirmed. Primary Phase Energy Transfer Panels at plus 1.3 volts per 9 mL square. Affirmative. Stand by to activate multi-axis laser control sequencer. Fuel in the chamber in 6 seconds. Mark. Red LEDs activated one by one down the left side of Brogan's coolant panel, indicating the moment when the first deuterium isotopes would be injected into the lattice origin for the multi-axis laser device. It would only be targetable by the mode-locked emitter for a few thousandths of a second, so everything had to happen at precisely the correct moment. Injectors aligned, maximum yields, coolant sink on standby condition green, chamber temperature 280 degrees and climbing, plasma barrier in 60 seconds. Dempsey shouted. The sound of millions of cubic feet of coolant accelerating through the overhead conduits caused the deck to vibrate gently. Then the vibrations began to intensify. Stand by to activate ignition sequencer. On my mark. Five, four, three, two. Dempsey clamped both gloved hands on the two-inch thick bar switch at the top of his panel. It was surrounded by so many warning signs he prayed he was performing the correct procedure. He felt like his heart and several ribs were about to climb into his throat. The roar of the cooling system didn't help. He heard Chief Brogan shout, One! and pulled with all his strength. There was a metal-on-metal -metal groan, and then the switch slid into the down position with a mighty thump. Red LEDs activated around the top edge of all the control mechanisms. A klaxon sounded. The LEDs began to slide in a pattern around the circular reaction chamber. Light bathed the four-story tall number four painted on the aft bulkhead in an ominous crimson glow. Chamber temperature now 3410 degrees and rising, Dempsey shouted. It was on his screen in yellow, so he reported it. 3000 degrees sounded like something out of a science fiction story, but Marine corporals weren't paid to think. They were paid to follow the orders of senior crew chiefs when it came to the ship and these finicky expensive machines that kept them running. Skywatch policy for Starship non-commissioned Marines was fairly simple. If it moves, salute it. If it doesn't move, pick it up. If you can't pick it up, paint it. Ha ha! Brogan shouted. Fire in the hole! A moment after the chief's voice echoed through the chamber just loud enough to be heard over the coolant roar, a deep resonant buzz filled the metal floor with a powerful vibration. The power readings on Brogan's console suddenly jumped to life, and he punched the reactor comm station channel control. Engineering to bridge. A pause. Go ahead, chief, Ensign Grant shouted, trying to make himself heard over the thunder of the cooling systems he could hear in his own headset. Transfer all power to reactor control. Stand by to engage the mains. Grant hurried to the bridge engineering station and quickly authorized the correct series of power transfers. Affirmative, chief. Reactor control at the engineer's command. Brogan's face was lit by the command display's message as it conveyed total control of the entire ship's power grid to a single console. He reverently let his fingers rest on the keyboard. All of the vessel's command and control mechanisms were now accessible from his station. He carefully directed Reactor 4's energy output to energize the reaction containment field. Bridge. Engineering. Main power now at 0.2% capacity and climbing. Argent is hot. Request permission to cold start Reactor 5. You are go, engineering. Mains engaged. Take us to 15% as quickly as you can. Brogan proudly walked over to the mass control bank. Corporal Dempsey was wide-eyed and looked as if he had just escaped a burning building. Congratulations, Corporal. Brogan shook Dempsey's hand. You just turned the key and started a battleship. Chapter 24 Kilo Alpha-3 rolled out of the Sarn formation and attempted a textbook evasive peel, but wasn't prepared for the other Skywatch ships. Black Seven came screaming in on Three's starboard edge. Her wings were raised like a belligerent sand crab, weapons glowing with barely restrained destructive energy. Behind the angry-looking little gunship loomed the guns of the escort frigate Minstrel. Dominique, how come there's a big red three on the screen? Please specify readout identifier, Commander. Each is labeled underneath the console control section. Oh, it says Takatil Display 11. 
Tactical Display 11 is tracking the position of inbound contact Kilowatt Alpha 3. What's that? Kilowatt Alpha 3 is a Sarn Agitator class interceptor destroyer with primary Type 4 energy mounts forward and an enhanced point defense battery aft. She displaces approximately 40,000 tons with a crew of 105 officers and men. Are they bad guys? Kilowatt Alpha 3 is designated a hostile contact with 98.4% confidence. Can we fight them? Affirmative, Commander. Abran began to perform her own combat readiness procedure, which consisted of making sure Boots was on her left side and Checkers was at her right. She straightened her oversized helmet as best she could, but it kept slipping down over her eyes. She still couldn't see anything clearly outside Black 7's forward viewports, so she grabbed the controls of Black 7 and started turning the maneuvering bar back and forth. Fortunately for her, the gunship was still under the primary auto system's control. She hadn't made the mistake of disengaging the battle computer, mainly because she didn't know how and likely wouldn't do so even if she did. She liked talking to Dominique too much. So for the time being, Black 7 at least looked like it was crude and battle ready. It was all scant consolation for Destroyer Number 3. Its captain would later undoubtedly receive commendation for being the only commander in the attack force well prepared enough to actually engage the Skywatch formation, such as it was. The only problem was the Sarn weren't all that well acquainted with Tarantula Hawk technology. Black 7's panic reactors went into full overload configuration. The ferocious little gunship's forward battle screens amplified to the point where they were easily equivalent to a cruiser's defenses. For a ship this small, such energy loads couldn't be maintained for long, but the key to gunship combat was knowing when and where to focus the first power burst. It was the T-Hawk way. Start no fight before your opponent has been punched in the mouth at least once. Kilo Alpha 3 opened up with her entire four-gun main battery. Under normal circumstances, the disruptive energy of Sarn anti-ship weapons would do considerable damage to a full-sized starship. White-hot beams of explosive plasma flashed through space and slammed into the oncoming forward section of Black 7. A strobing deflection blast lit up space for a thousand miles. The gunship tumbled out of its attack run and spun past Destroyer 3, forward screens fighting on the one hand to turn aside the enemy firepower, and on the other hand to contain and absorb as much of the energy as possible to channel into its own reactors. Ibran clutched boots and checkers tightly and shrieked. The entire universe turned into a spinning, tumbling roar. Overload alarms went off all over the board and the reddish glow of the gunship's battle alert filled the inside of the cabin. Dominique, what's happening? A coolant junction burst in the aft section, filling the interior of the ship with a deafening hiss. Abran held onto her helmet with both hands and screamed again, but the sound of her voice was overwhelmed by the blast of escaping superheated vapor. The command computer did not answer, as the entire vessel's operational capacity was working on the problem of avoiding a second hit from the destroyer's main guns. The battle computer's suggested course of action overrode the rest of the options as expected. After all, Black 7 was anything but a cargo shuttle. Fortunately for everyone involved, it turned out Abran's constant outdoor adventures, climbing, exploring, and running around had unexpectedly prepared her for the next maneuver. The gunship's main engine surged to 140% of their rated power just long enough to right the spinning vessel's navigational orientation. Somehow, Abran managed to survive the resulting 7G turn without losing consciousness. The new heading gave Black 7 a magnificent five-point weapons lock on Kilo Alpha 3's dorsal hull. The battle computer was just about to request a firing order when the not-quite-ten-years-old command pilot unexpectedly shouted, clutching her plush animals. Get him, Dominique, get him! The battle computer interpreted Abran's outburst as a firing order. It instantly deactivated the safety protocols and set the gunship to weapons free. Less than a second later, Black 7 opened up on the attacking Sarn destroyer. Electromagnetic shields flashed and burned with arcing plasma energy as the angry little gunship's brawler cannons tore gash after gash in the destroyer's battle screens. The Sarn warship's hull lurched and shook with the punishment until it finally roared out of range directly into the path of DSS Minstrel. Meanwhile, aboard the Skywatch frigate, Hollis Meyer was firmly ensconced at his own con with his battle harness fastened and more than a little perspiration visible across his forehead. Kilo Alpha 3 is on an intercept course, estimated time to weapons range 48 seconds. 
while he was a more than capable executive officer serving in the shadow of one of Skywatch's most promising young skippers, came with more than its share of challenges. Rebecca Islington was a shoot-from-the-hip captain with a sheaf of accomplishments to show for it. She was also a lethal and unpredictable space combatant, and she knew her ship backwards and forwards. Lieutenant Meyer, on the other hand, was a personnel and training specialist. He knew his job well, but Lord Nelson he wasn't. Under his command, Minstrel would acquit herself adequately, but there would be no flourishes, doffs of a hat or roses cast into the arena after the victory. Reverify our range to target. Inbound contact range now 130,000 miles and closing on oblique course. Signals, raise Argent on priority frequency, Meyer said as he pulled up the course information for Black 7. Channel open and you are patched in. Captain, any chance you can remotely pilot the gunship out of our command area? Minstrel can't maneuver if we have to bring it inside our missile screen. Meyer spoke as he tried to configure access to the fleet-wide battle computer. I'm sure it can be done, XO, but unfortunately there's nobody present on the bridge with the knowledge. Cal's never worked with a gunship wing before. Lieutenant Tixia could do it, but frankly, I'd rather have her where she is. Can Lieutenant Tixia advise? The channel clicked. Affirmative, Mr. Meyer, Zoni said. But I'm a little preoccupied at the moment. I'll defer to the captain. With all due respect, Lieutenant, you can't defer to the captain. She can't take command of Argent, and you can't relinquish command of Argent. If we're going to do this, we need to do it by the book, Meyer said. We have a civilian in Sarn Energy Weapons range. As you were, XO, this isn't the time, Islington replied. Ma'am, you and I both know. Mr. Meyer, Zoni interrupted. I'm not sure what all the protocol details here are, but at best I'm about eighth in line to command Argent, and I'm not aboard. Until we have orders otherwise, regardless of my regulation precedence, I'm going to defer to the only one of us lieutenants qualified to be addressed as captain. Fair enough? There was a tense moment of hesitation as all three Skywatch officers watched the tactical track of hostile contact Kilo Alpha 3 bear down on Minstrel. Fair enough, Lieutenant. I don't have any special understanding of the regs. I just don't want to end this little war standing tall in a room full of admirals. Minstrel out. The frigate's bridge crew sat tense, waiting for orders. All right, tactical. Plot us an evasive course port side 331 Mark 29 or 0. Sound battle stations missile. Stand by the mains. All ahead attack speed. Aye, sir. The bridge light shifted red as the action rigs activated the alert klaxon signaling a change in battle configurations. Coming about to new course 331 Mark 29 or 0. Helm answering all ahead attack speed. Hollis gritted his teeth. He should have coordinated his run with the gunships, but without battlespace telemetry, there was no way to synchronize the frigate's systems with those of the Argent gunship, and talking a civilian through the procedure would be impossible even if he had the time. It was all the more disconcerting to be flying into battle with such a massive advantage in tonnage and a simultaneously massive disadvantage in firepower. But, advantage or not, Lieutenant Hollis Meyer had a civilian to protect and a command to preserve to say nothing of protecting the largely abandoned irreplaceable leviathan in orbit behind him. As the agile little frigate veered out of the destroyer's optimum firing envelope, the Sarn ship decelerated and banked into a new course to pursue. Fortunately for the crew of the Minstrel, this was exactly what their ship was designed for, evading nose-to-nose -nose engagements while pouring anti-ship missiles into an attacker's teeth. Report weapon status. Missile stations report weapons banks 1 through 4 armed and standing by. Meyer checked his sidecon for possible electronic obstacles before entering the authorization for a standard attack pattern. Jettison launch. Aft missiles 2 and 3. The second watch tactical officer locked waveforms and released control to the firing sequencer. Four Phantom Tog anti-ship missiles were blasted into space by each of two aft rotary launchers. Each bird went into sprint mode and screamed into space on a bluish-white trail of chemical energy. The destroyer's forward point defense came to life like a stadium full of flash photography, pouring destructive energy bolts into the path of the oncoming missiles. Seven birds were ripped out of space by ugly explosions. The eighth punched the destroyer's forward shield with enough explosive energy to rock the entire ship. Internal fires initially caused by the gunship's attack reignited in the destroyer's dorsal weapons array. The sleek vessel started trailing plasma again as it banked port to try and close range with the dodging escort frigate. Chapter 25. 
Senior Lieutenant Rebecca Islington recognized she was out of time. She only had 8% power from a single reactor, but it was going to have to do. She took the pilot station on Argent's bridge. She expertly fastened her six-point harness and pulled up the ship's maneuvering overlay. Then she activated her comlink. All right, Brogan, it's you and me. We need to get Argent in the fight. Does the con have main power at command? Affirmative, Bridge. You're going to need to get us to 40 degrees starboard delta and synchronize engines 1, 2, 7, and 8. If you overshoot, we're going to catch the edge of the atmosphere on our starboard quarter and lose a flight deck. If you undermaneuver, we go down nose first, but that's only if we stay in one piece. Acknowledged, engineer, it's been a while, but I've had my moments at the wheel. Stand by to transfer all power to engines. Aye, ma'am. Just remember flying this thing is like kicking whales down the beach. If you turn the wheel, she'll get around to it next Tuesday. I'm going to leave power levels and vectors to you. Give me some kind of clock so I know when to break range and bank us to bearings level flight. Stand by on priority intraship. Captain Islington shook her hands to relieve the tension in her wrists and fingers, and then she took Argent's controls, throttle in her left hand and the manual navigation bar in her right. Cal, you watch our deflectors. If feedback energy breaks 10%, that means we're cutting atmosphere. Give me the count and stay with it. Aye, ma'am. Navigational deflectors to maximum. We are cleared for manual flight mode. Cal grabbed the edges of his own console, anticipating what was about to happen. Under normal procedures, auto systems would pull heavy or super heavy vessels out of orbit due to the precision synchronization necessary. This time, it was going to be done by two officers and an engineering chief separated by 30 decks. Breakaway course starboard, vectoring 040 relative, all ahead full. The immensity of the power that surged into the structure of Argent's decks and bulkheads was almost more than Captain Islington was prepared for. She knew every sound her own ship could make. The almost seismic subsonic resonance was like nothing she had ever felt before. Her entire body shuddered. As the engines were filled with practically the entirety of Reactor 4's power, Battleship Hull 740 started to overfly its orbit. Captain Islington waited until her relative forward velocity was enough to overcome the first inertial push. She held the throttle tightly, drawing more and more energy from the mighty vessel's portside engines. Watch that coolant flow, Corporal, Brogan shouted across the auxiliary control bay. If it drops too much, it means turbulence in the transfer mechanisms. We've got no heat sink capacity left in this thing at all, so we can't miss our numbers. Affirmative, Chief, Dempsey yelled back. He sort of understood some of what Brogan had shouted. It was amazing what a completely untrained combat marine could learn in a half hour at a reactor mass control console. Islington held on to the controls like she was trying to tame a Mustang. Report tactical. Feedback now 0 0.7 and holding. Islington decided not to wait. She banked Argent's starboard edge and watched the readout. Two degrees. Three. Reverse starboard engines. One percent per clock second. Affirmative, Bridge. You've got it, Brogan shouted. The sound of the coolant roaring through the connector deck at supersonic speeds made him feel like he was in a fusion-powered hurricane. He held on to the electronic shielding cage doorway near the auxiliary power controls to ride out the captain's breakaway maneuver. Argent's bridge deck began to vibrate noticeably. A violent fire began to heat Argent's port quarter armor array. High-energy flames trailed more than 200 miles behind the enormous ship. Starboard course delta now 11 degrees, Islington shouted. Trailing feedback levels now 3% and rising, Cal replied. Everyone realized it at once. The ship was skidding, traveling faster forward than starboard with its leading edge pointed away from the direction of fastest travel. Brogan's voice howled over the intraship. We're skipping on the atmosphere, Captain. Don't overthrust your port engines or we'll buckle the escape track. Acknowledged, Engineer. Port engines to 40%. Lieutenant Islington could feel the gigantic ship fighting the forces of physics. Ultimately, Argent had to win. That's what these big, heavy vessels were made to do. It was the principle that allowed humans into space in the first place. That said, the laws of physics never made things easy. As she pushed the manual navigation to starboard, the energetic reactions from her engines and the very real physical obstacle of an entire planet's extreme upper atmosphere sheared against the battleship's drive field. She nudged the throttle forward, holding the huge handle with all the strength she could muster. The bridge was experiencing the spacecraft equivalent of a medium-sized earthquake now. Rebecca Islington held on to the pilot's controls, 
wondering if she was going to fly the biggest fireball in Skywatch history right into the Bayonne Ocean. Feedback energy 6% climbing. Islington cursed under her breath. The engine power balance wasn't right. That wasn't necessarily to say it was wrong. A pilot more experienced with the idiosyncrasies of a heavy ship's flight envelope would likely spot the problem and have an instant fix. The captain's problem was she didn't have the experience, and she was being asked to get that experience while clawing her way out of a big object's very dangerous maneuver and a much larger object's gravity well at the same time. Starboard course delta now 27 degrees. Feedback energy now 8.8 .8 and climbing. Brogan's voice barked again over the intraship. We hit 10 and we'll cavitate our drive field. He ran across auxiliary control to do a quick inspection of the coolant transfers. What he saw was more terrifying than what his captain was attempting on the bridge. The relay valve was white hot and filling the entire chamber with a ghostly pale glow. Corporal, open auxiliary coolant transfers. Say again? The Marine shouted from the other side of the machinery. Open the transfers, all of them. Negative, Chief. The control console reports mechanical assists are all locked in the closed position. It will take ten minutes to disassemble the braces and standards. Brogan stumbled backwards and grabbed an overhead gantry ledge for support. He gasped for air. He could feel the ambient heat from the valve from where he was standing almost one hundred feet away. If it ruptured, the backblast would vaporize three decks. He activated his comlink. Bridge, you've got 30 seconds to power down, or we're going to lose primary engine cooling. Islington's blood ran cold. She fought the urge to bank the ship further and just run for the heading goal of 40 degrees. The problem was if she overshot, the big ship would end up flying engines first into a 10,000-degree firestorm. If the ruptured drive field and cataclysmic heat didn't kill everyone, the G-forces would. The problem wasn't heading. It was the thrust vector. There was too much lateral power and not enough medial power. The captain made a snap decision. Engineering, bring port engines to 45% and increase counter power only one half percent every clock second on your starboard engines. Decrease coolant volume to match power output. Affirmative, ma'am. Port engines to 45% power, Brogan shouted. It was a long shot, but still a rather inventive idea. The engineering chief knew his captain was no slouch but he never expected potentially brilliant last-second solutions. That was what engineers were supposed to do, not flight officers. Feedback energy now 9.5% and climbing. Come on, Argent. I know I'm just a frigate skipper, but give me a break. Islington held her helm, using every ounce of strength to will the huge ship where she wanted her to go. From Minstrel's point of view, what happened next would have made even friendly captains hold their shock frames a little tighter. A giant of a ship banked powerfully and began her turn out of Bayonne 3's orbital track. When the forward hull crossed the 40-degree delta and the engines synchronized into a forward course, the frigate was momentarily caught in its fleetmate's gargantuan shadow. It was enough to steal the breath of everyone on Minstrel's Bridge. A cheer from Skywatch personnel went up over the command net as Destroyer 3 suddenly found itself out of position and in the path of an awakened leviathan. The Sarn vessel dove away and kicked up its engines into an evasive course. Target Kilo Alpha 3 veering off, sir. Meanwhile, the lead Sarn destroyer was now head-to-head -head with a vessel that outgunned it 60 to 1. All right, Cal, open a hailing frequency. Engage real-time translation protocols. Islington stood, fitting with something at her collar. Ma'am, I... Islington squared herself to the forward view screen. Ensign Grant decided not to press the issue and tentatively activated the battleship's transmitters. Channel open. Attention Sarn warships, this is Captain Rebecca Islington of the Skywatch battleship Argent. We have you under our weapons. You are ordered to stand down and retreat from core space. If you do not comply at once, we will engage your formation with lethal force. Acknowledge. Cal had to admit his captain was doing a magnificent job of being in command of a 34-deck ship with a crew of five. All of them knew if the Sarn took a moment to run a clean life sign scan of Argent, the jig would be up. All Cal could do was flood local space with as much ECM noise as possible and pray. All at once, the forward view screen snapped into a view of the emblem of the Sarn Star Empire. Islington swallowed reflexively and raised her chin. Either she looked the part or her words weren't likely to be heeded. Aboard Minstrel, Meyer sat up straight in the command chair. Their view of the Argent transmission was the same as the Sarn commander's.
Islington's XO, however, was the first to notice his captain was wearing Twin Eagle rank insignia. It was a flagrant violation of regulations to impersonate a superior officer, especially one three full ranks higher, but Hollis had to admit it was a clever touch. The Sarn might be ill acquainted with Skywatch regulations, but they certainly knew the difference between a lieutenant and a captain. Hollis wasn't entirely sure if this particular Sarn officer would know how relatively young and attractive Islington was compared to most other Skywatch captains, but it was too late now. Captain Islington. Humans never seemed to get the hang of Sarn appearance. Their ships were built like volcanic caverns, with atmospheres that would incinerate a human respiratory system in seconds. Their visages were a close match. This is first-scale Yala of Sarn and Vector Gliss. You invade Sarn space and destroy our vessels. This is an act of war. The seething red interiors with the distorted dark reptilian faces made it difficult for human personnel to gauge reactions in these confrontations. Yala, however, wasn't hard to read at all. Cal's face had long since drained of its color. He did note with a small tinge of optimism the Sarn captain wasn't quite as belligerent as their race normally was. Being literally in the shadow of your opponent's ship would tend to moderate one's attitude, the tactical officer thought. But he also remembered he and his dice-rolling CO represented 40% of Argent's manpower. Come now, first scale. The Bayon system was ceded to the core council in the Gitarn Compact years ago. Surely you have been advised by your government this is core space. Your ships were weapons hot and on an obvious attack course. We simply defended ourselves. You annexed our Triluminum claims. That is forbidden under the terms. We claim this space as reparations. What do you propose, First Scale? I cannot speak for my government, but I will speak for my ship. You are intruding in my command area while we are engaged in rescue operations. We've already sunk one member of your task force. I have three flight decks full of fighters just waiting for a green light and a target. If you want to see Sarn space again, I recommend you disengage. First Scale Yala looked askance at his own screen, performing the reptilian equivalent of a raised eyebrow. How long have you been in command of such a powerful ship, Captain? I relieved Jason Hunter a month ago. He was injured during a recent engagement. Interesting story, Cal thought, and not far from the truth. Indeed. Please send my condolences. You seem so... How do the humans say? Adolescent? I'll take that as a compliment, first scale. I have a rather grueling training regimen that keeps me in shape. I spend my off time studying weapons and tactics. Nice, Cal thought. Hollis Meyer sat open-mouthed at his captain's brinksmanship. At best, his side had a pair of threes. By Captain Islington's manner, you would think she was betting kings full of nines. Meanwhile, First Scale Yala was far less impressed. Although he was fairly certain there was something not quite right about the situation, he had to respect the fact if Argent fell over drunk she would crush what was left of his task force. He had been advised the ship was abandoned. As a target for military intelligence and plunder, she was one thing. If she were minimally crude and opened up with even a wildly inaccurate barrage, it would be devastating. Toe-to-toe, -to -toe, even three full-strength destroyers didn't stand a chance against the fury of a fully combat-capable battleship, to say nothing of her fighter and gunship wings. Yala also had to concede the fact he no longer had three destroyers. Very well, Argent. We will leave it to the Emperor to decide your fates. I strongly suggest you retreat to core space before we return. Invector Gliss transmission ends. The screen snapped back to the Sarn emblem. Before the auto systems reactivated the internal carrier signal, Islington started unfastening her borrowed rank insignia and whirled on her tactical officer. Recover Black 7 right this second. I don't care how many ships or personnel it takes. Clear? Clear, ma'am. Coding your message.